Thank you so much, Margaret. Appreciate that. Well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's crazy. There's snow on the ground. And some of you, you know, you had to get up and you had to shovel to just get out of your spot or to get out of your driveway. And you had to go that extra mile. Maybe some of you had to shovel more than one person's walk like I did this morning. And maybe uh, you're thinking to yourself, uh, was it worth it? Well, I'll tell you, if you were here this morning, the worship was just fantastic, wasn't it? And it just, just being aware of the reality of God, it changes us. You know, um, we've been going through our series. We've been doing a series in the book of Ephesians, just a delightful book. And we've, we've seen all that God has done for us. We've seen this deep theology of who we are in Christ. We see our position, and it's just an exalted position, not because of anything we've done, but in complete um, uh, dependence upon God, we've, we've come to the reality of what he's done for us, and we've received this wonderful position through his mercy and his grace. And so everything we do from that point forward, the moment that we embrace who Jesus is and what he's done for us and put our faith in him, everything we do as Christians is in response to his grace for us. In light of all that he's done, we don't do things to get God's favor. We don't do things to have God like us more. We don't do things to get his blessing. God blesses us and therefore we want to do things for him in response out of gratitude. And we could never thank him enough, right? And that's really what this series has been about. It's about seeing who you are in Christ and then saying, now that I am this wonderful, exalted child of God, why don't I live a little bit more like a child of God? Uh, for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about what we call this worthy walk and what it actually looks like. A walk that is worthy of the calling. What does it look like to live it out, this enlightened life, this life that's been empowered by the Spirit of God. Because if we're a child of God, if you've trusted in God as your Savior, you have God's Spirit. And so now we have a new enablement to do things that we couldn't do ourselves. And so we've been reading some things, and, and everything in this passage uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 that we've been talking about, it just could be summed up in something really simple. It's about a selfless life. Because really, before we knew Jesus, before we had any motivation uh, to want to live for him, we basically lived for ourselves, right? And this selfless life is a different kind of life. It's one that says, I consider others above myself. Paul says in the passage we were reading uh, just a couple weeks ago that we are members of one another. So this worthy walk that we're talking about is, is a life that produces this authentic community of believers. Now, for some of this, for some of us, <laughs> this concept is sort of radical. It's a radical departure from the old life because all we ever thought about was ourselves. And now all of a sudden, God's saying, hey, I'd like you to just look around and see who's next to you on your right and your left. See who you're doing life with. Uh, now that we're saved, we recognize that we are part of a body and all of our actions affect those around us. They affect our brothers and sisters. So the things that Paul has been addressing, they're the very things that we need if we want to promote a healthy, unified body of believers. I mean, these are the things that make good relationships. But what happens when we don't treat others well? Well, I want to look at this verse here as just a, an introduction to just as a touchstone what we're going to talk about, we're going to get to. But I want you to just look at this verse. After saying all these things... He talks about, he says uh, right here in uh, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's, he talked about a lot of different things. We've been talking about very practical stuff, right? But like lying or anger or stealing, right? So when we lie or when we display this sinful form of anger, or, or when we steal, or when we tear down other people with our words, um, what we're doing is we're grieving the heart of God. 
It's, a, it's an uh, interesting concept, don't you think? Do you, do you realize that? Do you, do you realize that we grieve God? And do you know what grieves God? Just those things that we've been learning. When, when brothers and sisters don't live together in unity, when those who have been given so much are clinging on to this bitterness and anger towards someone who has wronged them. And I just think how much it saddens God when we lash out with intent, with our words to inflict harm on someone's soul. We want to, ooh, stick a, a, a real uh, sword in their side. Have you ever considered that your behavior can grieve the heart of God? It says that the Holy Spirit is grieved. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He's a person. He's, he's an infinite being, but he's a person with feelings and emotions just like you and I. And because the Holy Spirit has been imparted to us, because he indwells us, he is intimately connected with us. We have his divine nature dwelling in us. So every time we sin, it, it hurts God. Every time we sin, we're resisting the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And, and it's not because God, it, it, just because God is holy, it's because he cares about us and he wants the best for us. And it kills him when he sees us hurting ourselves or, he, or when we're hurting other people. And you know, as parents, we can relate to this, right? I mean, it would just kill me to see my kids walk away from God because I'm crazy about them. I'm crazy about my children. And as a parent, I want what's best for them. So I don't want them to make the mistakes that many people before them have made. So that's my desire, and that's God's desire for us. And so Paul says, this spirit with whom you have been sealed, by the way, that means you are sealed. That means God has you. You are formetically sealed. <laughs> You're sealed by God with his very own spirit, and he will hang on to you to the day of redemption. Because your salvation is not based on your behavior. It is based on Christ. If it were based on us, we would never know for sure if we were good enough or we were able to be, meet God's standard or whether God would accept us. That's religion. But Christianity, the Bible says, that it's all based on what Christ did for us. So we can have confidence that we are sealed. We're sealed to the day of redemption. And he's saying, this is this final consummation. You can look forward to that day when you no longer will have to worry about the struggle with sin at all because you'll be glorified at that moment. So he goes on. Look, at, look what he says in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away. I just think about these words, you know. He says, I, I want all these things. And, and then he even adds one on the end with all malice. He's just really, really intensifying this, this kind of behavior that is so unbecoming. He says, let all of this stuff, remember, put off and put on. He's saying, let all of this stuff be put away. Instead, and then he says this word. Look at verse 32. This is just a stunning, powerful verse right here. It says, but instead, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Wow, that's a tall order. You know, if you read it in the, in the Amplified Bible, it says, be kind and helpful. And then he talks about being tender-hearted and compassionate and understanding and forgiving one another. And then they add the words readily and freely. I mean, that's the concept. This is not just, you know, a token um, kindness or a, a, a token tenderness, but it's, it's just this expansiveness. I, I, I want you to know God wants more for us because we have the ability to produce more in how we treat one another. Um, let me tell you a story. Uh, I read about this story recently. There was, a, there was a young man years ago, and he was at seminary. And he was looking for some type of an internship to do at a church over the summer. You know, work in a church, any kind of position, but he, nothing opened up. So he decided, well, I got to get a job. I mean, any job's going to do right now. I got to pay my tuition. And so you know, the only thing that he could find was a job as a bus driver on the south side of Chicago. Great. 
Well, he needed the money, so he took the job. And after learning the route, he was put out there on the street on his own. And uh, here he was, this brand new driver in a dangerous part of town, mind you. And they probably put him there because he was the low man on the totem pole. But uh, it didn't take long before he realized just how dangerous the job really was. So one morning, he's driving down on his route, and um, a gang of tough guys boarded the bus, and they decided they didn't want to pay. They ignored all of his warnings and his protests, and they kept riding until they decided to get off. But all the while, while they're just making fun of him and ridiculing him, and uh, this went on day after day. The same guys would get on the bus, these thugs, and then they would, they would uh, make his life miserable, and then they'd get off, and they wouldn't pay. So one day, he saw a policeman on the next corner, and he said, enough is enough. And so he pulled over, and he reported them uh, to the police, and the police officer came in and said, listen, you either pay or you get off. So they paid. They paid, and that was great. Unfortunately, unfortunately the police officer got out, and he said goodbye. And uh, as soon as uh, the bus turned the corner, the gang beat this young man up mercilessly. And um, when he regained consciousness, he was covered in blood and he had two less teeth in his mouth and both of his eyes were swollen almost shut and all of his money was gone and the bus was empty. Wonderful, so glad I did this. So after returning to the terminal, they said you could have off for the week and he went home to convalesce in his small little apartment. He flopped on the bed and he had just such... Dis, uh, disheartenment, such discouragement. And he was confused and he was angry and he was a little bit resentful towards God. He said, you know, God, you know, uh, how can this be? I mean, where are you in all of this? I wanted to serve you. I want to pray I, for a wonderful ministry. I prayed that you would give me something and this is what I ended up getting. And I was willing to serve anywhere and this is the thanks I get. I get beat up. So, he was kind of feeling a little pity party for himself. But uh, on Monday morning, he decided that he was going to go in and press charges. So with the help of the officer, they rounded up the gang. They had a couple other testifying witnesses. And they had these guys all pulled together in a couple days. And they had a hearing before the judge. And then they walked, uh, this man walked in with his attorney, this young man. Uh, and across from him were this angry gang members glaring at him and as he looked at them something happened he was overtaken for some reason his heart just melted and instead of feeling bitter he started to feel compassion for these men and his heart went out to the very people who had attacked him and it was obviously God's spirit kind of convicting and working in his heart. And he, he no longer hated them like he did over the weekend, but he started to have pity that, you know, these were people that didn't have the same privileges and opportunities that he had. And, and he started to realize that they needed help. And uh, all of that hate that they had, they didn't need any more of it. They didn't need any more of it from him. So needless to say, the, the, the trial was, in, uh, was engaged, uh, and there was a guilty verdict. And this young man um, kind of surprised everyone, including his attorney, because he, he stood to his feet, and he requested permission to speak. And he said, Your Honor, I'd like you to total up all the days of punishment against these men and all the time sentenced against them, and I, and I, I want you to allow me to go to jail in their place. Well, <laughs> the, the judge kind of stammered. He never heard anything like that before. And everyone sat there dumbfounded. Um, and the gang members, their mouths were wide open in disbelief. And he said, as he looked at them, and it's because I forgive you. And he looked right at them. And the judge said, young man, you're out of order. This sort of thing is not done. And, uh, but the young man said, um, oh, yes, it is, your honor. It happened over 1,900 years ago. There was a man from Galilee named Jesus, and he paid the penalty for all mankind that they deserved to pay. 
And then he proceeded for the next three or four minutes without interruption to explain how Jesus died on our behalf, proving God's love and forgiveness. Well, guess what? He wasn't granted his request, but the young man did visit those gang members all every week in jail, and he led most of them to the Lord. And uh, he began, began this significant ministry to many other people on the south side that's still going to this day. You know, over the next few minutes, I want to talk about what God is calling us to. We're talking about something greater that can be produced in our life, and it's not natural. It's supernatural. Today, I want to talk about an unimaginable display of love. This, I, I want to talk about an inconceivable love. I want to talk about loving in a way that people will be staggered by. What kind of person forgives people who have hurt them so deeply? And that's exactly what Paul is suggesting here. God is calling us to have a completely different response to being hurt. The most natural thing to do is to get even with those who have hurt us. And, but God is saying to us, he wants us to respond like Jesus, right? That's the whole goal of this, is that we would start acting like Christ. So it's unfortunate um, in this passage that there's a chapter division, because this really shouldn't have had, uh, it, it kind of flows together if you just read it. Let me read that verse to you again, and then right into chapter 5. But it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So, you, you know, you look at this passage, it says that we are to be imitators of Christ. What was Christ like? I mean, remember Jesus? Remember when he was mistreated and he was abused and he was betrayed and he was abandoned? What was his response towards his perpetrators as he hung there bleeding? I mean, his life is ebbing away, having endured such unspeakable torture, uh, and yet there was no hint of hate. And he... He hung there and he said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine that? What man would pray for the very men who were executing a death sentence? Who, the, the same people who had beaten him with glee. What could drive this man to forgive those who were actually murdering him? And it was really simple. It was because his love, the love of Jesus, was greater than his hurt. The love that Jesus allowed himself to be unfairly treated, to be ridiculed and abused, his love for their soul was greater than his need to be vindicated. What's more important, that I be vindicated? These, I never really did understand the Old Testament. They have these things called the imprecatory psalms, where the Israelites would you know, would want to have, the, you know, please destroy my enemy, wipe him off in the face of the earth. <laughs> Just really harsh, you know, because I think the real heart of God is that he's always striving after us. He's always trying to reach us. Now, this wasn't just a momentary act of love on the cross. This epitomized Jesus' whole life. It was what he taught the people. He wanted them to respond in a radical way. If you look back in Matthew, remember Matthew chapter 5, verse 43? He said, you know, you, you remember that passage. You know, it's the one that uh, people sometimes quote. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He said, but what? But, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a revolutionary concept. I'm sure that when Jesus made that statement, it caused quite a buzz in the crowd, don't you think? But this was Jesus. This was who he was. God is love. He was the epitome of love, the selfless servant, the one who washed his disciples' feet, the one who prayed for his persecutors. 
It's a love that loves in spite of the other person. It's a love that loves despite what other people do. It's saying, I'm going to love you because God loved me. And if you're, if, God, if you're good enough for God to love, then you're good enough for me to love. This is the kind of love that we've been called to. We want to love like Jesus. That's what he's saying there in being an imitator. This is not an easy love. In 1 Corinthians 13, we, we all heard this passage of love, right? It says in verse 5, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It, it is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. What does he mean? I mean, when you love someone, you don't hold on to the grievance. When you love someone, love keeps no record of wrongs. See, are we more concerned about being right or being like Jesus? Would we rather point out the failures of others? We like to do that, right? We like to smash, smash their, their failure right in their face, right? Or would we rather be motivated by our desire to live together in unity? You know, I talk about this in marriage counseling. Many times I've had couples who came to my office, their marriage is in crisis, they're dealing with a problem, they don't know what to do, and uh, you're listening to them, and many of the things that they're complaining about are so trite. It's so, so silly. He leaves his socks out on the bedroom floor. Oh my goodness, they're ready to call a divorce attorney but he, because he leaves his socks out on the floor. So I would say to them many times, is this the hill that you're willing to die on? This issue, do you, do you want to be right or do you want to be one? And that's really the bottom line. Is this the issue that's worth sacrificing the oneness of your marriage over? And sadly, most people are willing to throw away a relationship that they've invested years building to maintain their superior position over their mate. They want to be right. They want to maintain their moral or intellectual high ground and superiority over that person. And it's just like we've totally missed the boat. That's not love. That's dominance. But, but what, if, what if a person really deeply hurt you? What if someone really, really did something grievous to your soul? So that's where you're at the crossroads. Maybe you could forgive a little sin, but what about a big one? What about a giant sin? So we're at that crossroads where we either forgive and reconcile, as the passage says, or we continue to blame and accuse and judge and hold that over them. Hold that person accountable until they die. Forgiveness is the ultimate expression of mercy and grace. And it's really what supernatural love looks like. When you show mercy and grace, you are, you are showing that person the character of God. Mercy and grace is rare. People don't, people don't want to extend an extra benefit of doubt to people. They just, wanna, they just want people to do things right. And if they don't, I mean, people have short lists. They don't, they don't put up with people very often. God says, where's your capacity to love that never fails, it says in that passage in Corinthians again, right? But no, no, we have limits. We have parameters of how far we will love. And this thing about forgiveness, because eventually someone's going to hurt you. So then what do you do? You know, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, we all have prayed that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Have we? <laughs> we love to be forgiven, right? We ask for forgiveness from God and other people, but we don't always, we're kind of stingy. We don't want to extend that same response in return. Do we forgive our debtors? I remember that story of the man that Jesus talked about who owed a great debt. You remember this story? It says that he owed the king 10,000 talents of gold. And yet the king looked at him and he wiped out his debt. He canceled it completely. He was, I mean, this guy came to him and he was an unworthy recipient of such an uncommon, kind gift, right? 
this lavish act of kindness and forgiveness. He didn't deserve it. What he deserved was to pay his debt. But this magistrate, this king, took pity on the man. He forgave his whole debt, which he probably wouldn't be able to pay off in his whole lifetime or in a number of lifetimes. And then, in barely a heartbeat, this man walks out. He meets up with another man who owes him a debt. And the debt that he was owed was about 100 days' wages. So what does he do? He starts to choke the man and throws him in prison until he pays off the debt. It's like disconnect somewhere here. Now here, let's get some real perspective on this story. A denarii, a denarius, is a day's wage for a common working man. So in today's world, a, a person making seven twenty-five an hour, anybody making that little? No, it's much higher here in Illinois. Uh, but that would be about 58 bucks. A talent, however, is equal to 6,000 denarii, or 20 years of daily wages for a six-day work week. <laughs> that's, a, that's a crazy, that's a, that, today one talent, one talent would be valued at $348,000. $348,000 for one talent. So Jesus here is using this story, he's likening Peter and the disciples to these unforgiving servants. They each owe God 10,000 talents. Just imagine yourself. Put yourself in that place. You owe God 10,000 talents. And God has forgiven that debt to you. He's forgiven it to them all and to you as well. And Jesus points out that um, one is forgiven such a debt and goes out and demands a debt owed to another. Don't you think that would greatly offend God. He has forgiven you a 10,000 talent debt, and yet you want to hold a smaller debt against someone else. It would be equally offensive if after he paid our debt in full, we insisted that we had to give him a little bit more, that Christ, well, he didn't do enough. We, we need to add something to what Christ has already done. But the bottom line is, is that God has paid our debt, and there's this, this, this all we have is a debt of gratitude. So getting back to the story, 100 denarii is a significant sum to owe someone. This guy, he probably should pay it back. But the way that he went about it was all wrong, right? In modern money, that would be about $5,800 that he owed this man. And uh, it wasn't terrible debt. But you know this guy? This guy owed this king 10,000 talents equal to 200,000 years of labor, or 60 million working days, or $3.48 billion in today's money. That's how much he owed the king. You see, we have a debt that we cannot pay. And so God says, I know you can't pay it. So he paid the debt. He's done it all. He's paid the debt. He's forgiven it. And then we can't turn around and forgive we had a debt that was so huge because of our sin. It's not because we're the worst um, dregs of society. It's because we're sinners. And God is holy. And God says, listen, you have a debt you cannot pay, but I paid it all. So we have this huge debt that God has paid. And, and the moment we trust in Christ, he wipes our slate clean. He says, paid in full, and you are now accepted by God. And one day when you die, you're guaranteed a place in heaven. God says, you're my child. I have canceled your debt. And then we turn around. After all that lavish grace, after all that mercy, after all that forgiveness, we turn around and we hold something against someone else that's hurt us. He says, why can't you forgive as I forgave? Right? See, this is the kind of exceptional inconceivable love that God wants for us. He wants us to love in a different way, an infinite type of love, a supernatural love. I always get choked up when I think about the prodigal. You know, to think about the prodigal, the son goes away, he lives a profligate life, he goes in excess, he wastes all of his inheritance. He said, Dad, I'm off to see the world, and he comes back 
after being in a pig trough, he finally grovels and comes back to his father, and he starts walking down the road, and I, his dad, did he have his arms folded and said, hmm, I, he's got a word for me. Did he do that? Or did he say, listen, when he gets to the, when he gets to the porch, send him away. I'm not, I'm not, he's no longer my son. He didn't listen to anything I taught him. I'm going in the house. Did he do that? No, it says that he saw his son in the distance and he ran to his son because he loved him. That's the love of a father. And that's the love of a father for us. He's so forgiving. We fail him so often and he just keeps on forgiving. Where, where, great, uh, where sin, extend, uh, where sin is, is great, uh, grace is more. God's grace abounds the more. For every time we fail, God is willing to embrace us and take us back because he's a loving father, a forgiving father. And so I think that's the kind of model that we want for our lives as Christians. Now that we have known Jesus Christ and trusted him as our Savior, why not love in an inconceivable way? Be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. That kindness, that tenderness, we're so hard. We want a tender heart to love people like Christ loved. So, you know, we talked earlier about grieving the Spirit of God. You know what would grieve the Holy Spirit the most? I mean, more than anything else, I'll tell you what God wants. God wants men and women to come to him in faith. To reject his salvation, which he's so freely offered, would distress him more than anything else. And that, and that is the truth. Um, there's a verse that says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's patient. He's holding out. And Jesus loves this sinful, rebellious world so much. Why? I don't know. But he's calling us to choose him. He's longing us to trust him and place our faith in Jesus to save us. And if we'll do that, guess what? We'll be forgiven. Isn't that amazing? God says, I will in no wise cast you out. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast you out. He will take you in his loving arms like the, like the prodigal son that came to his father's porch. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. So don't break his heart. Today is the day to say, God, I need your forgiveness. If you've never re received his forgiveness, you need to understand it because that's what transforms our life. And then when you have personally experienced God's forgiveness, you have no problem forgiving others. God will enable you. So I pray that you have experienced God's forgiveness personally. Let's pray. Father, this is um, a picture, a story um, of a life um, that is lived um, for all of us. We all have... Um, many hurts in our life, and it would be easy for us, Lord, to just uh, focus on ourselves and forget about everything around us. But Lord, you said that as believers that we can love in a new way, that we can care in a new way, that we can, um, we can fo uh, focus on cultivating our relationships with one another. So I pray, Lord, if there's, there's anybody here who's never received your forgiveness, that today they would say, Lord, I know I, I'm a sinner. I have a debt I could never pay. But I believe your son, Jesus Christ, paid my debt, my infinite debt, because of his infinite love and mercy, because of his infinite perfection, his sacrifice paid the infinite price. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I believe that, and I'm trusting in Jesus today. And if you're trusting in Jesus and you're his, and he loves you, and you're forgiven.